Hey guys, before we get started, I'm a little bit sick while recording this. You absolutely gotta love storms that come out of nowhere during the summer, right? So yeah, that's why I sound a little bit off. But, on to the video. This is the story of United Airlines Flight 1722. Hawaii is a US state like no other. It's the only state that's made up of islands. This means that getting to the state requires you to either get on a boat or on a plane. And let's be honest, most people are going to be flying. This means that the airports of Kahului and Honolulu handles a lot of traffic. On the 18th of December, one of those planes was a United Airlines Boeing 777 with 271 people on board. The jet was to make the trip from Kahului Airport to San Francisco. This was one of the many flights that connected the islands back to the mainland. The pilots of Flight 1722 were on the ground at Kahului, and they punched in the data into their flight computers. The computer would then spit out how to fly the takeoff. It would tell them how much power to use, how long the takeoff run would be, all that sort of stuff. Contrary to popular belief, you just don't go full power for all takeoffs. That would tax the engines too much, reducing their useful lifespan, like by a lot. So instead, you'd give the computer the conditions that were expected at the time of takeoff, and then the computer would give you an optimized departure profile. On the 18th, their calculation showed that they could get away with a reduced thrust takeoff, with the flaps set at 20. But as the plane started to taxi, the controller threw a wrench into that idea. You see, the sensors around the airport had picked up wind shear. Wind shear is a weather phenomenon when the direction of wind quickly changes for a short period of time. Think of it like a current of air that can push planes off course. Or worse, pilots always need to be cognizant of wind shears. That is why modern jets are equipped with wind shear detectors. This information changed their plans. The captain now decided to go for a maximum thrust takeoff with a flap set at 20. This would allow them to punch through the wind shear with no problem at all. As Jeremy Clarkson says, power and speed solved many things. And indeed, this was one of those cases. So with their new plans, the pilots taxied the 777 all the way to the threshold of runway 02 at the airport. The night was dark and rainy and the pilots couldn't really see that far out of the night. The departure would take them over the dark Pacific Ocean and so they would have to keep an eye on their instruments as they flew out to figure out what their plane was doing. With that, the pilots lined the jet up with the runway. The lights of the runway shone into the dark rainy night, leading them into the dark Pacific. The captain pushed the engines to max power and engaged the auto throttle. The computer would now take care of the power setting while the captain hand flew the plane on departure. The 777 went through 80 knots and everything was fine. Then came the V1 speed. At this point, the pilots were committed to this takeoff, no matter what happened. After a few short seconds, Flight 1722 lifted off into the dark sky. The jet gained altitude as it left Hawaii behind. Then, right on cue, the plane's airspeed indicators began to fluctuate as the jet punched through some turbulence. This is what the controller had warned the pilots about when they were on the ground. As the plane picked up speed, the captain called for flaps 5. They were flying fast enough that the plane could have enough lift on its own without using the flaps or with the flaps being at 20. The first officer carried out what the captain had asked for, and he contacted departure to discuss the weather with the controllers. But the captain noticed something strange. The max speed on the primary flight display was lower than expected. On the primary flight display, you have this blue speed ribbon, and on the ribbon, you have this red overlay that shows you the maximum speed that your plane is capable of in the current configuration the plane is in. It's a very simple idea. Stay out of the red and you'll be fine. For whatever reason, that red bar was much lower than expected. He expected to be able to fly the plane a lot faster when the flaps were at 5. Then, the plane really started to pick up some speed. The captain grabbed the throttles and pulled them back to avoid overspeeding, thus overriding the auto throttle. He quickly scanned the instruments to see what was wrong with his jet. He saw that the flaps were at 15 and not 5 like he had asked. So he asked for flaps 5 again. This time, he made sure that the flaps were now in the 5 degree detent. The first officer was also now trying to troubleshoot the issue. He knew that the captain had some issues with airspeed control, so he asked the captain if his instruments, the one on the right hand side of the plane, were malfunctioning. But before the captain could reply, they noticed that the plane was starting to nose down. The captain called for flaps 1. The jet picked up speed and the control column moved forward, sending the jet into a harrowing dive just a minute after takeoff. The situation was not getting any better as the jet screamed towards the Pacific at hundreds of knots. At this rate, they would hit the ocean in just mere seconds. In the cabin, people knew that something was really wrong. Passengers said that they felt like they were at the top of a roller coaster, and then the plane just dropped. Rob Williams, a realtor from Ohio, was flying with his wife and kids, and they were all flying for the very first time. He said, quote, We were praying for a miracle because we felt like this could be it. End quote. 
As they prayed, screams filled the cabin. He looked over to his wife and he tried to keep calm for his kids. In the cockpit, a very different story was playing out. By this point, the GPWS, or Ground Proximity Warning System, had kicked on. It was telling the pilots to pull up. The first officer also just said, pull up, pull up, pull up. Responding to all of this, the captain yanked the yoke back as far back as it could go. His training now kicked in. This was a classic CFET recovery, or controlled flight into terrain recovery. He pulled back power on the engines as he worked on getting the nose of the plane away from the water, and slowly it began to work. The nose of the plane started to pull up. But the question was, would they have enough altitude to pull it off? They didn't have a lot of altitude when the whole ordeal started. They were at 2100 feet. And the one thing that you need when you're recovering from a dive or a stall is altitude. Luck was on their side. Flight 1722 bottomed out at just 748 feet. That's like less than one Eiffel Tower away from the water, or the length of 854 average length CBS receipts. Yeah, I did the math on that one. Once the plane had bottomed out, the captain commanded full power from his engines to get them back up to a safe altitude as fast as possible. Once they saw that they had a positive rate of climb, the captain brought the nose down and re-engaged the autopilot. Once the plane was climbing away, the captain got on the intercom and calmed the nerves of everyone on board and said, Alright folks, you probably felt a couple of G's on that one, but everything's gonna be okay. And he was right, according to reports, the plane pulled 2.7 G's while pulling out of that dive. As a passenger, it would be scary to feel that while taking off in a stormy night. Then the NTSB quickly jumped into action to figure out what had happened. Well, I'm just kidding, not really. The NTSB did not open an investigation into the incident for more than two months, and by that time the flight data recorder and the voice recorder had been overwritten. I don't think this was intentional obfuscation by the pilots or the airline or the FAA. This story was first broken by the air current and a United spokesperson told them that the pilots fully cooperated with the investigation and the FAA said that the incident was reported to them. An investigation wasn't immediately mounted because the NTSB wasn't told about the investigation as it did not meet the criteria set out in Title 49 Code of Federal Regulations Part 830.5 which is this bad boy document right here. This meant that the investigators of Flight 1722 had very little to go off when it came to understanding what had happened. Two months is a very long time when it comes to aviation. They had the testimonies of the pilots and data from flight radar. That's it. So what exactly happened here? Well, you see, all of this started with the first officer mishearing one single word from the captain. During the climb out, the captain called for flaps 5. The first officer misheard him and selected flaps 15 instead. This meant that the plane was not configured as the captain expected it to be. He was expecting a plane that could fly fast. This is why the plane's max speed was much lower than he expected, because the flaps were out. But at the same time, you have to remember that the flaps were pulled back from 20 to 15, and this caused the plane to pick up some speed, and the speed limit of the plane was low and the thrust was relatively high. So this caused the plane to get uncomfortably close to that speed limit that it had. This caused the captain to pull back power on the engines aggressively to prevent the plane from overspeeding and potentially causing damage to the plane. As this happened, they rectified the flap situation by selecting flaps 5. But now the plane is low to the ground and at a low power setting with the flaps mostly retracted. This caused the nose of the plane to start to drop and thereby the plane started to lose altitude. That one simple mistake had spiraled into a situation that was threatening an entire airliner. From there, thankfully, the captain's training kicked in. He was able to recover the plane. But it is very scary how easily this could have ended in a crash. If these guys hadn't been as observant as they were, they could have easily fallen victim to the startle effect. The startle effect is kind of like fight or flight, but for pilots. You see, if the first sign of trouble that they had was the GPWS warning system telling them, hey, pull up, then they might have pulled back on the stick so much that they might have lost control of their plane or stalled it out. This is exactly what happened in the case of Air France Flight 447. Moreover, they were over a dark ocean with no lights on the horizon. Losing situational awareness would have been quite easy in that case. But thankfully, nothing of that sort happened and everyone landed safely. How close do you think this plane was to crashing? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to watch another video, then how about the story of a United Boeing 747 that almost flew into a mountain near San Francisco? Jesus Christ, what is it with the planes that are flying in and out of San Francisco? Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.